All right, thanks everyone for coming. Um, today's uh, speaker is Dan Allen. He's from the synchrotron at the at Brookhaven National Lab called NSLS2. And he works, uh, he's the group lead for the, um, what was it again? Uh, data science. The data science and system integration. Not read of, but a, a read in, yep. Okay, and also a uh, scientific software developer. Um, he works on data acquisition, management, and analysis with the Blue Sky ecosystem. Uh, that's a thing in the light source community, not, maybe not so, not, not so much known here um, at NERSC or CRD. Um, yeah, and he will talk about uh, Tile, which is a service they use, they are going to use to uh, make data available for the users at the Synchrotron. So, Dan Allen, just take it away, please. Sure. Somebody holler if you can see slides. Yeah, that looks good. Great, going full screen. Stand by while it flickers. Still good? Yep. Great, yeah. all right, so uh, so I wanna be clear about the stage this work is at. We're, we're here to, to collect ideas and, and comments. Uh, this is building on a project that you could say goes back about six years, so it's not, something we're new to thinking about, but this latest iteration had its first commit in February of this year. So we're at a stage of looking for feedback on how we're framing the problem, uh, any opportunities we might be missing in the way that we're thinking about it, connections to other work that we might not know about, uh, and, and especially uh, people who wanna play with this early and, uh, and give us feedback and maybe even work on it with us. So that's, that's why we're here. Um, uh, the team, such as it is, uh, my supervisor, Stuart Campbell, Thomas Caswell, is also the lead developer of uh, Matplotlib, Marcus Hanwell, who you may know from his work at Kitware, who joined NSLS2 recently, and Juan Marilanda, my postdoc at ALS, uh, partner Dylan McReynolds, and his postdoc, Joseph Kleinhens. Um, some of this work was influenced by collaboration with a project called Intake out of Anaconda, run by Martin Durant, working with uh, Garrett Bischoff at NSLS2. So uh, to zoom way out, the problem that we have at, at user facilities like NSLS2, which are effectively, uh, yeah, NSLS2 is 28 small research groups sticky taped together, right? And they have extremely different data scales. We have groups that are producing a gigabyte in a whole year and groups that produce terabytes in a day. So there's a lot of volume and there's a lot of velocity in these things that people talk about. But I think the interesting problem at NSLS2 and at user facilities like it is the way that this increased data scale is driving our variety problem. People used to be able to capture the variety in uh, you know, ad hoc data formats and in notes and in context that they hold in their heads. And as they can no longer do that, uh, we're, we're getting a whole host of new challenges. And these challenges are a little different than the ones that our friends in climate and astro and high energy have faced and to a large degree solved before us because their data structures are known in advance. But at a synchrotron, somebody can walk up with a random new instrument and, and expect to be able to plug it in. And uh, importantly, from our point of view, incorporate that in their data structures and in their data processing pipeline downstream. So the workloads are very dynamic and there's a lot of heterogeneity across all the, the groups that we're responsible for supporting. Um, Could I just comment, Dan, sorry. Yes. There's a little bit of distortion on your end. Oh, uh, that's, un that's not great. Let me check my sound yeah. settings. I don't know if other people experience that. Turn the game down, Dan. Turn the game down. <laughs> How's that audio-wise? Pretty similar, uh, but it's not like um, it's not unbearable. But I just thought it was an easy. How about now? Oh yeah, that's that's better, but a little it's quiet. Better. Yeah, yeah. So if you just okay, talk about up a little bit. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Thanks for speaking yeah. up. I appreciate that. Back to the slides. Great. And we're back. 
So we have we have many file formats. Um, we have uh, we're, to some degree that's driven by whatever the vendor of the, the hardware specifies. And that's not always the most convenient format to work in. Also, we have a large number of scientists that we work with and support, both the people that, that work in our facility and can be to some degree wrangled and the users who we serve as, as more or less customers who really, you know, really can't be wrangled, that we, they, they want what they want. Um, they're also largely stuck under this mode of, of parsing data out of file names and not really thinking about searchability or databases in any scalable way. This is just where our field is. And as a software support group, like the one that I'm in, this gives us a lot of variety that we have to wrangle and, and invest in. Um, so we'd like to become unopinionated about file formats. We'd like to have this idea of a service that we're calling tiled sitting between the data, however it is, right? So some of our data is in nice searchable, scalable databases, and some of it's just a directory of files, and some of it might be in services, uh, including Globus or, or one-off uh, use case specific data services. And what if we could transcode the data into the format that the users want on the fly, and more importantly, or just as importantly, access it partially. So rather than knowing that we just have an opaque file, knowing that we have a specific structure, like an array or a table with certain columns, and being able to access that uh, both through purpose-built clients, like the Python client that we have and, and others that we may plan, and something as basic as curl or a web browser or, or a purpose-built web portal. All of these things are interested in accessing the parts of the data that they need in the format that makes it most convenient for their downstream work. Um, we want to get away from relying only on metadata in file names. We want to support searches both that rely or that expose the full complexity of some underlying database like Mongo, where you could filter your data sets by the motors that you used or a temperature range or the sample under study and higher level queries that might rely on less programming knowledge and might also be more portable across storage mechanisms with different backends. So this leads to, to Tile. Um, its goal is to improve data access for data science and scientific analysis generally, uh, leveraging open web standards and scientific, uh, scientific computing standards, trying to be uh, as, as non-clever <laughs> as possible and using standards that people can already easily interact with. Um, so as I said at the very top, this comes on top of years of thinking about similar things. Uh, I personally trace it back to this, uh, a project for abstracting over getting image sequences into Python um, that Tom Caswell and I both happen to collaborate on. At BNL, we tried to generalize this to not just image sequences, but all kinds of data. We learned about a project out of Anaconda with similar goals of abstracting over IO, but at the end of the day, very Python centric, right? Getting your data from however it's stored into Python. But Intake had the germ of this idea of a server where you could have a, on the server side, all the complexity of doing the actual IO and then just sending a rather thin Python client, the metadata and the data in this chunk wise fashion. But Intake's approach was uh, not as performant as we needed. And it was also focused very much on Python. The HTTP API wasn't something you could easily interact with from, from curl and make any sense of it. So we set out to reimagine this in a service first approach uh, that abstracts out the IO in the same way as these other attempts, but does it in a more multi-language and, and web oriented way. So at the end of the day, the goal is to separate the storage of data from the access of data, where the service in the middle acts like a, a transcoding service, right? These things exist uh, in industry for video transcoding, where YouTube is transcoding different you know, versions of a video. This is kind of like that, but for scientific data is one way to think about it. So let the analysis code say, I want some appropriate format for my data and uh, support a, a bunch of the ones that are common, like TIFF and CSV and arrow natively, but make it extensible. So as we run into particular use cases, we can just add them. Um, by separating how we store the data and how we access the data, we can change our minds about how we want to store the data over time without breaking the analysis code. And you know, a use case in my mind always is the postdoc who writes a really fancy analysis routine, but deeply embedded in that is the assumption that the data is stored in TIFF files with a certain directory structure and file name. And then if you want to change that to blob storage and czar or some other format, 
uh, you have to go back and understand the science code. You can't just switch it out. If we can have the science code interacting with NumPy arrays and pandas data frames, or in other languages, the, the analogous structures, uh, then we can separate that IO and future proof our code better. So by standardizing on structures and not formats, and by kind of surrendering that we'll never get everyone to agree on one, one format, we can, we can get a lot of value, I think. Uh, because software tools might disagree on the ideal storage format at rest, but they universally understand concepts like a strided array or a table of data and hierarchical structures of these things. These are agnostic really to how they happen to be stored or the programming language that they happen to be used in. So for example, if I have tabular data, I could request that as Apache Arrow, which is a, the modern uh, tabular format that seems to be taking over and it's pandas uh, blessed wire format. Uh, and we can re read that very efficiently into uh, in, uh, data structure in Python, for example. Um, but we also want to be able to interoperate with simpler interfaces that need CSV or Excel. And so here's an example of accessing a data set from Todd's Python client as a data frame, and then accessing that same data uh, as uh, uh, JSON, in this case, could be CSV, and here as HTML. Array data, similar story. Uh, if you're pulling it into Python, you probably just want a C ordered buffer that you can declare to be a NumPy array. Uh, but you might also want a TIFF for something like ImageJ written in Java. Doesn't know about what to do with a C-ordered buffer right on the box. Um, you could do two-dimensional image arrays as PNG for the web. You could do CSV. And most importantly, you can slice these things, right? By, by saying that a tiled server is not just a glorified Apache server or a static file server, by saying it has to be able to open and read and open the files, you are able to do things like put slice parameters in your URL that give you just the sections of the data that you want. And this is great for building uh, web portals with thumbnails or for uh, launching parallel workers like Dask workers that are each grabbing a different chunk of a data set in parallel. This all uh, works very nicely. And we'll, we'll see examples of that. So it, it naturally integrates with Dask, which also has this chunk and partition based view of the world and from there into you know, your favorite scalable uh, data science application or library. And we have all the standard useful things that you can do with a web service, modern web security standards, pluggable authentication. And to here, we're really looking to Jupyter, which uh, has had such success being deployed across, you know, all of the institutions that we really care about. So rather than having a user sign up system or something, we're doing bring your own user management system um, it says Jupyter Lab, that should say Jupyter Hub, integrate with uh, PAM or OpenID Connect. Uh, we're, we, have, we have plans to integrate with others in the future. We have a, an idea of programmable access enforcement. So for example, at NSLS2, we have uh, access control at the level of a proposal. Users submit a proposal, take data on that proposal, and then their access is by proposal. And Tiled has to integrate with our proposal system to know who is allowed to see what. And that's uh, about 50 lines of Python. I might have a chance to, to show it uh, to integrate with our particular uh, access control and, and you could do as well with others. Because we're a service, we can do clever things to make things fast. So we, we, we have an ambition. I don't think we've achieved this in any case I've measured, but we have an ambition to make this faster than, um, than local file access in some cases, because oftentimes there's a significant encoding step and some disk that you're waiting for to pull data up into RAM and into a, a memory layout that you can actually work with it. And we can, we can use our knowledge of what data sets are popular or likely to be accessed to cache in advance or uh, you know, based, on, based on user access patterns, the data directly in a memory layout that it's useful to the analysis code to make things very fast. We also have a concept of client-side caching like a web browser has. So, once you access a data set a first time, it might get saved locally and then be faster the second time with standard web semantics around checking that the data hasn't been changed since you looked and uh, an offline mode as well. All right, so I'm gonna get into, let me, let me actually pause here for a breath. I'm gonna get into an interactive demo and then try to leave plenty of time for discussion. The next couple slides are our dense kind of feature bingo. So 
hopefully you'll see one or two items in there that interest you and, and you want to ask about. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through it in detail. But at the moment, what we have that, that works today is this idea of a, a tree structure of data that you can think of as mapping onto a directory or some tree-like semantics like a Nexus file to explore data sets. Each data set has metadata, just like a, an attribute in HDF5. Uh, we have arrays, including NumPy record arrays, structured arrays. We can do data frames and Apache arrow tabular structures, uh, as well as X-Array. We can integrate with Dask to create uh, Dask objects that wrap HTTP requests. So you've got something that you can use as if it's an array, but only actually fetches the data it needs when it needs it. I'll demo that. We've got configuration on the server side and on the client side that, that has nice validation and auto-generated documentation. We're doing compression in uh, all the popular ways. We have a nice CLI that I'll demo for running the server and inspecting the config and so on. We can serialize in a bunch of formats, some of which I've named, and we have documentation on how to add more. We have some nice instrumentation and Prometheus metrics so we can observe the performance of the web application as people are using it and, uh, and optimize. And we have pretty decent docs. What's in progress right now, or, or, or prototype and working, but I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't stake my life on it, is uh, basic shared secret authentication, like, it, like a basic uh, single user Jupyter notebook would have. We have OAuth 2 authentication with refresh tokens implemented. We can horizontally scale using the standard tools, so you can have multiple server processes serving your users. We've deployed it uh, in Docker on spin at NERSC. So that's one way that you can deploy it with containers. Um, we have uh, standard web caching. We have service side in process caching. Um, we, we have a, a, a way to dispatch to custom, custom objects on the Python side to give users exactly the the structures and the kind of overall user experience that they want so that tiled can kind of be buried inside domain specific applications that a couple of our users have have built for themselves so the idea is that tiled doesn't have to be the thing that the users know they're using right they can just kind of be be hidden in the stack and be hopefully giving some nice features for free uh behind whatever user experience uh wants to be at the front end of that interaction um we have we have dreamed of uh, uh, batching these transcoding jobs in an asynchronous way, uh, having some sort of Redis-based caching so that multiple workers can share the cache. Uh, we've been talking with the developers of Awkward Array, which, if you don't know, handles uh, ragged, uh, ragged uh, deeply nested structures coming out of the um, uh, NSF-funded CERN-affiliated group Iris HEP. Uh, we care about sparse arrays and image pyramids. And, uh, and, 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 and so on and so on. I guess I'm, I'll, I'll blur through the rest here a little bit because it's a lot of a wall of text. The last piece is tiled is currently for reading. The data underneath it can, can change over time and it can update to that, but it doesn't let you write through the, uh, through the web client. So a, a user or a client of tiled can't initiate a change to the data, but that is something we're very interested in and are likely to prototype early next year. Um, so in, in terms of you know, our commitment to this and, and the scale of deploying it, I've said it's very, very early work. I would call it alpha code. So we're really here for feedback. But if you're interested in the trajectory of the project, it is three clause BSD licensed. Uh, it uh, has, a, has a governance model in progress. It's uh, supported by the, the program that I work in, uh, led by Stuart Wilkins and Stuart Campbell at MSLS2. And uh, our, our deployment is internal, but will be exposed externally as soon as we finish undergoing a, a penetration test uh, in coordination with BNL Cyber. And uh, we, are, we are betting our data access on this. We've been using the, the Python-based data access that this grew out of uh, for years, and we're looking to build on that with this service and, uh, and support it for the long haul. Uh, so uh, some final thoughts before the demo, uh, you know, in terms of what this really is. It's not file-based access like Globus. It's something that would sit well alongside a service like Globus because uh, it has to actually open the files, right? It has to know, uh, know what they are in order to provide this partial access. It's not, uh, it's not a serverless framework. It's not a format. 
I think that TileDB and Czar are in this space solving a similar problem of par partial and highly parallelizable access to data by asserting that everyone should standardize on that format. And I think there are fields where that works, but I don't think synchrotron science is one of those fields where you can assert a standard uh, storage format that everyone works with. We need this ability to meet scientists where they are and let them, uh, you know, let them take the data in whatever form they need it. Um, it is not a data analysis framework. You could imagine deploying it inside of a larger architecture that does RPC data analysis, but it's never going to grow uh, a, a server route that does some expensive analysis, anything beyond slicing and the things that you need for access. So I would say it's, uh, uh, I guess I, I said this later, this next point already that it's service first, what's different is it opens the files and the, the requirement, uh, uh, the design here flows from this requirement that we have many different scales, many different access patterns and conventions and opinionated scientists who <laughs> know what they need and, uh, and our job is to give it to them in that form. We've been talking to a lot of folks about this, shopping it around, collecting good ideas and uh, some nascent interest. Diamond is hiring someone or is, is placing one of their new hires on this to look at it in January to see how it might fit into their architecture. And, uh, and a couple other folks may be trying it in the near future. So with that, I'll take a breath and set up a demo. I can take a question or two while I switch contexts. Okay, uh, let me move around some things to get this aspect ratio right. How does that look? It's good. Great. Okay, so this is what it can look like to serve some data with tiled in Python. This is like the most minimal version of this that you can make, where you say, I just have a NumPy array and another NumPy array and a data frame with three columns in it that's partitioned up and some metadata with a date in it or something. And I want to make this available, this data available to my users via tile. So what you can then do, this is sort of a, a demo route in tiled, is tiled serve pi object, pi object, and give it the, the uh, path to this. So this happens to be within tiled itself. Wouldn't have to be. And that starts a web server. And if you've ever typed Jupyter Notebook, you see a similar output from them. They generate uh, uh, one time uh, or, or, or for this for this process, they generate a random API key to make it secure so that other processes on this machine can't spy on that data. I'm going to turn that feature off for this demo just to make it simple by going public. I want to be clear, I, this is designed to, to have a similar experience to Jupyter. It doesn't actually, I'm not saying that it uses Jupyter internally or anything like that. All right, uh, and then over here, we could with curl, you know, look at this, look at this data. And we could say, tell me about the data set called A and we get some output. Now, I just want to demonstrate that that works with curl, but it's nicer to use um, this program HTTP, which gives you nice color coded output. It's a little more modern than curl. So it's going to describe this data. It's going to tell me that it's in apparently one single chunk that's 100 by 100. And we can see the endianness on the size and that it's float and that it's an array. And it gives us various links that we could use to get at the data. So we could take that link and get the data. And okay, it gave us some binary. That's not great because I'm in a terminal. So I could ask for instead text, for example. And there's the data as CSV. I could also look at the metadata for this and that has the date in there. This is JSON, so the best we can do is stringify a date. I might say that's fine, uh, but I'm, I want that a little faster and more compact. So I could ask for that in message pack, for example, which is a more efficient binary format. So having done this from just a basic web client, now let's upgrade to a Python client. And we'll just connect to localhost port 8000 from the Python client. 
And what we have now is a user experience that is something like uh, something like H5Pi, if you've ever used that. It basically treats this tree of data as a dictionary. Oops, capital A. As the dictionary that I can get into to get various things. That hasn't done any major I.O. yet, because it doesn't know if I want the whole array or just some of it. I could get the whole array in the same way I would with H5Pi, or I could get just part of it. And it's only sending what I actually want. Um, with the data frame client, I can grab just two of the columns, for example. I think it was called x, y. Yep, and there's a data frame with two columns in it. If we go over and look at what the server's up to, we can see it's asking for block 0, 0 of this array. It's asking for a partitions 0, 1, and 2 of this data frame, and so on. So from the user point of view in the Python client, this feels just like I'm working with a file or something. But under the hood, it's making uh, potentially authenticated HTTP requests. Let's go with a larger data set now. So I'm going to delete the word minimal, but do the same thing. This is going to take a moment as it allocates some memory to make a big data set and then kicks off the server. Coming back over here, uh, we now have various uh, data sets of various sizes. So if I were to look at this big image, for example, and pull that whole thing down, that's going to take a while. I think this is a couple hundred gigs, if I remember right. And I could, or maybe it's, I'm not, I'm not going to swear about that size. Anyway, large enough to take a moment so that we can demonstrate this next bit where I can say, use a special registry of clients for this that instead of greedily downloading the data, will create Dask structures that, uh, that do so lazily. And so now the same thing gets me a Dask array with the given shape. And now I'm just in Dask. So nothing about this object is particular to tiled. There are tiled function calls wrapped inside this Dask object. But I can go in and grab like a 10 by 10 section and uh, compute that. And that would be fast, because it naturally only ran the Dask tasks that it needed to give me that answer. And we can see over here, it asked for just block 0, 0 of the big image, oh, block 0, 0 of the big image. If I were to compute the whole thing, then we'll see batches of requests going out for different slices. You can see these slice parameters here changing. And this is uh, these are happening in batches of about eight, because that's the number of Dask threaded workers that are running in parallel here. So all this falls out pretty naturally without a lot of uh, with no like special knowledge of tiled in my analysis code. I can write this like it's um, like it's basic Python data science code, and everything kind of works the way that I expect. I'm going to go into a web browser now. and make some requests from there. OK, so open up a new tab, localhost 8000. If I just go to the route, it tells me some things like what version is this and what formats does it support for each of the different structures and so on. Um, but I, I know what I'm looking for, so I'm just going to type it. I'm going to say I want the full array of medium image. and Browsers, when they make requests, give a list of formats that they understand. And one of them is HTML. Uh, so Tile generates an HTML page with an image in it based on this data set. And if I give it, I bet you can't see what I'm typing, but if I type slice equals colon 10, I can grab just a strip of this image. And Tile is going to read the minimum amount that it has to read to get that data and then send only exactly what I've asked for. I can do you know, multi dimensional slice as well. So I can do uh, colon 100 and then 50 colon 100 to get like a rectangle of data, something like that. And I could ask for that as um, I could say and format equals uh, PNG. And now I've got it as just a PNG in a page that I could save. Likewise, I could go in and say I want the short table data set 
name one of the data sets in here that I could see if I listed them. And that again renders as HTML. But if I ask for it as XLSX, I'll get an Excel spreadsheet. Oop. No, I won't. I'll have to think about why that's not working. Oh, I see. I missed that there should be a question mark. Yep. And now that's just downloaded an Excel spreadsheet. If we go back to our server and make it a little more, uh, make it more permissive of where it will accept requests from. So I'll kill the server, add this environment variable to say accept requests from this origin. Now go back to Chrome and pull up this website, Plotly Chart Studio. Chart Studio doesn't know how to read the data formats that this data could be stored in, but it can import data by as CSV. And so I could ask Plotly Chart Studio to grab data frame full um, short table as CSV. And it just loaded this data, which I can then choose to plot, right? And if, if this is a really wide table and I, only, I know that I only want certain columns, then maybe I should instead ask for localhost 8,000 column equals A and column equals B, but not C just the columns that I want. That should work. I've got an extra slash. All right, and now I've grabbed just these two, these two columns. So it's, it's a, a partial, partial access is the selling point here. All right, the last thing I wanna show is an example where we have data that just comes to us as files. And so it's probably maintained by a research group that does not know or care about structured access to data. They don't have a database yet. They just have a directory of files, but I'd like to have you know, something useful for them. I can say tiled serve, tiled serve directory public, and then example files. So let me, let me show you what the example files are first actually. So here's the example files. I've got some nested directories. I've got some TIFF, a CSV, an Excel spreadsheet. That's what's going on in here. So now I'll tell tiled to serve this directory. And this is just a sort of a built-in convenience, you know, one use case, one way of integrating where it's gonna walk this directory lazily, look at the file extensions, try to figure out the MIME type from that, and then give me something I can work with. So now I've got my client seeing these data sets that are backed by files. And let me reconnect without Dask. We don't need Dask for these small data sets. And that is array data that originally came from TIFF, but my client doesn't have to know that. I don't need to have a TIFF reader installed in this environment. I just get an array. Likewise, if I look at this table, this happens to be stored as CSV, but I don't have to care. I can just get it as a data frame. Something else I might wanna do is cache this so that I'm not downloading it all the time. At the moment, we don't do that by default. Maybe someday we will, but cache on disk, my cache stuff. That's gonna generate files in a directory that are uh, treated as internal. You're not supposed to poke at them or know what they are, but tiled will manage them. Where if I go and access some data like this, and maybe what's in this one? Maybe this, and then I kill my server. So that's offline. I can still access this data. And if we turn on some logging, we can see what's happening here, where this thing is reading, these, reading this information from a cache. I can then even quit start our Python again. If 
if I try this, it's going to fail because it can't connect to the service offline. But if I tell it, OK, be offline, then it will rely solely on the cache until I tell it it's online again. And I can go in and access anything that I've already accessed. So it works exactly like a web browser cache. And in fact, when you hit tiled from a web browser, uh, the same mechanism is, is exercised. Um, the last thing I want to mention before opening up for, for thoughts and, and questions is a word about authentication. I see there are questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll circle back at the end here. Uh, right. So here's an example of um, from the documentation that you can find. I'll put links in the chat at the end where there's a, um, a public demo deployment of Tiled that you can log into with, um, with your ORC ID, if you have an ORC ID. And so what happens is it gives you a URL to paste into your browser. You paste that into your browser. You get prompted to log into ORC ID. You get prompted to approve this Tiled application to integrate with your ORC ID identity. And then you get an access code to paste back into, uh, into Tiled. This is exactly how Globus's CLI works. And now you can, you can access that data. This works by, uh, let me find it. This is an optional aspect of Tiled. I think some people use it as a personal utility running it from the command line like I showed. Other people will maybe use it as a fully public data service with no authentication needed. But if you need to integrate with uh, system uh, user accounts, you can do that with a PAM authenticator, just like JupyterHub does. If you need to integrate with Google or ORC ID, you can do that with uh, an OpenID Connect configuration. And uh, the working example of that is the one in the, in the demo uh, I just scrolled through. And then you can control who can see what. And so to give a sense of how that might work in a toy example, if I've got data sets A, B, C, and D, I can generate some, some users with a really dumb dictionary authenticator that's just for, for toys and testing. And I can have this access policy that says who can see which data sets. That obviously does not scale. Uh, so the, the, the way to do this in, at a facility scale is to have some other programmable access policy that's making, uh, you know, making requests against some, uh, some you know, user, uh, uh, user management system. And that just to show you, you know, it's not really that much code. This has caching and logging and all the bells and whistles. So the, the actual functional part is like 10 or 15 lines to get something that, that integrates right. So that's at a 10,000 foot view how authentication and access works. I'll do a quick demo of that. I know this font size is terrible. Give me a moment. Where's presentation mode? Presentation mode. Okay. Um, so here I can connect to NSLS2 with a little shortcut that has the URL and other configuration that I want. And I can connect to this tiled demo deployment. And I can grab different, uh, different data sets out of the two that, um, uh, that are based on searching for, say, something that has to do with nickel. So in this public deployment, I've got some reference, some reference data set that I, is on nickel that I know is uh, that I know is good and interesting. So I'll go ahead and grab some data out of that, just like you would out of an H5Pi uh, uh, data set or something like that. And I can grab some data out of the uh, NSLS2 BMM instrument, also based on nickel, where I'm looking for the same fields. And I can you know, look at those two data sets and presumably plot them together and so on. I won't take the time to go through that now. But that's the general idea, that there's this unified interface. You can deploy it in a federated fashion uh, publicly, privately, uh, with different authentication me uh, methods on each. And then uh, once you get the data into your workflow, whether it's with Python or with curl or whatever you're doing, um, it's, it's a fairly consistent experience. Um, so that's, I think that's it for me. I'll leave screen sharing on, but uh, happy to take questions now. I'll start by looking at the chat. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, sure. This was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, I think there were a number of questions coming in. So um, do you have the chat? Do you see the chat itself? Uh, yes, I do. Now I'm looking at it. So I mean, just uh, mm -hmm. go in order. I think they'll 
connect us as first. Sure. So the, the question is, what standards does Tiled leverage? So I would say the authentication standards that, that I mentioned, starting with OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, the way that uh, authentication, the way that we, we, we get your identity is a standard, and the way that we uh, refresh your access uses uh, um, JWTs and refresh tokens and something called sliding sessions, which is basically the user experience where it's use it or lose it. So up to some very high limit, as long as you use your tiled access uh, once a week, you stay logged in. But if you you know go away for break for a week and a half and come back, you're logged out. That's the that's the uh, the access that uh, we think our cyber security is going to be okay with, and it's pretty good ergonomics for the user. So that's what we do. Um, then the, the standards of uh, uh, the way that the metadata is laid out, uh, the formats that we support, uh, we're trying to invent as little as we can. Uh, and so a lot of this is based on the HTTP spec, modern authentication standards, and modern uh, data science formats. That's the, that's the one sentence version. Um, um, oh, oh, Dylan already answered it better. <laughs> Sorry, uh, go ahead, Dylan. I missed a few things. There are a lot of specs. I just wanted to add for the record, uh, purpose of the recording, like yeah. HTTP cache control is, for, is supported and um, you didn't invent a whole new format for requests and responses. You follow, it follows the JSON API uh, standard for, for, for the actual message bodies. Right. Um, and, you know, so just a point, another thing I pointed out in the chat, but I'll say again in, out loud, um, you know, the, the, the Python client hides a lot, hides the fact that there's HTTP going on underneath, but all of those features that are being served by, uh, as an HTTP, HTTP server sh are, are intended to be available to HTTP clients easily. So one of the things we really wanted to do was to be able to have sort of simple access in a web page in addition to more complicated data science uh, use cases from from a Python client, all served from the same service. Right. Maybe maybe it's worth. I, I showed the logging stuff when I was um, when, when we were hitting the cache, but it's it's more fun to show it when it's actually doing something. So let's let's do this with no cache. Oh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I have to turn the server back on if you want to do that. That makes sense. Okay, so here are connected. And I think I've still got my, do I still have my logging on? No, uh, logger, okay, so there we go. So now we can see when I just looked at this in order to get this wrapper in IPython, an HTTP request went out and what it was asking for was the first couple names of the entries so it could show me something uh, to display. And if I go in and I ask for that more thing, and I go in and then I ask for, actually let's do, let's just grab an array. That's the simplest thing we can do. Let's look at what that did. So that, first of all, ask for what's, what's even in this and it got back a response. And in that response, you can see timing. This is really useful for optimizing the thing. So we can see it spent like 19 milliseconds in the application, uh, basically less time than we could measure, compressing it and, and a little bit of time uh, tokenizing it. Similarly down here, we're asking for a block of an array, block zero, zero, which I think is the only block. And uh, yeah, sending in all these things, we can see it was BLOSK encoded and the time that it was spent reading it, tokenizing it, compressing it, what kind of compression ratio we got. This is an array of ones, so it compresses very well. Uh, and 43 milliseconds all told spent inside the app. So all the stuff in the Python client is doing HTTP requests to do everything it does. Um, and we hope that we have not baked any Pythonisms into this. We're working on uh, uh, JavaScript, TypeScript uh, uh, client, and we've played around with the C++ client just to make sure we're not uh, baking Pythonisms in. Uh, Shrey has this question next. What, when, do you, when you serve up something with Todd, do you need to tell it what backend to use? That should be that should be something the server figures out and uh, not something that the client has to say. So if you're doing uh, if you're accessing NSLS2 data, we have a proper Mongo database backing all of this, right? And so we have a database that either has the data or is referencing uh, HDF5 files somewhere that have the large array payloads. So that never has to guess what format it's supposed to read, and everything is just handled. For the for the directory walker, which is sort of a 
you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a toy. We, we're trying to make it very good and fast, but it's the scaled down use case where you've got, you don't have database infrastructure. You just have a directory of Nexus files or a directory of TIFFs or something that you want to serve. For that, it is using heuristics to figure out what files it has. And there are ways to, to tell it specifically what's there. There are ways to tell it about file extensions it doesn't know about or MIME types that it doesn't know about. Um, I'll find a link to the docs at the end here and, and, and link you to that specifically. Did that answer your question? Let me rephrase the question. So I, I guess I was, sure. so yeah, I was, I think it makes sense that the client is agnostic to the backend type, but so on the server side, let's say I have a Mongo data, I have some data in a Mongo database. I need right. to tell Tile specifically, this is a Mongo database and, you know, I guess, how do I tell it how the data is laid out? Um, right. The Mongo database is essentially just freeform JSON on some level. And like, yeah, what is the, how do I get the server to recognize a file, a file type or, or if I have things in different file type, if I, if I have my data in, two different formats, one's in a Mongo database and then there's some CSV next to it or what have you. Like, yeah, right. You need to do uh, so, so to some degree, uh, let, me, let me switch back to the browser and show docs. Um, okay, so to some degree, if, you, if these things are sort of separated and they're not related, like I've got a, uh, I've got a Mongo database, wait, where'd it go? I've got a Mongo database and a and a directory of CSVs, and they're just two things that I want to serve. That looks kind of like this, where you can basically give a subpath and say, this is a directory, and here it is. And then uh, this is a, just another directory. But uh, in, in your case, it would say the name of a, a Python, a path to a Python object that connects to your Mongo database and presents the, the interface expected by tiled. Um, we have an example of that. Uh, in public for NSLS2, but it's probably, you know, not reusable by you, right? It's an example you could work from, uh, but it's not, uh, it's specific to the way our Mongo collections are organized and the what the documents within them mean. I think there's probably, there's probably low value in having like a generic Postgres adapter, a generic Mongo adapter. You could make such a thing, I think, but it might be too literal. I think there's usually meaning in, in the internal layout of the, of the database that, you want to you want to program against a little bit to give the users the experience that they want. Okay, so the idea is that you would basically write that adapter in the tree dot whatever your adapter is, and that would right. Be the okay. Right, okay. and as you'd imagine, this does not have to be in tiled, right? This could be any importable object. So yeah. uh, you don't need to get it in by pull request. You can just do your own thing. Cool. Um, Thank you. This yeah. looks awesome, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think next, um, thank you very much. Next, Roland has his hand up, so. Yeah, um, this is really exciting. It's really nice to see the, the rate of progress as well. I think you mentioned like the first real commit was like less than a year ago. Um, I wanna ask a question about scale. Um, yeah. Because you're shifting, you're shifting the transport of the data over to HTTP and um, at NERSC, when we buy, traditionally, when we, when we buy a supercomputer, we buy platform storage attached to it. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to today read in 20 terabytes of data into 200 GPU nodes or something like that on Perlmutter, the obvious way to do that is to put the data on Perlmutter Scratch. And if I've done my job right, I've got it in a, a good format that will do GPU direct IO or something like that. Um, right. The question is like, what scale of data set are you envisioning being a reasonable fit for this? Um, and um, just to even like be more provocative maybe, like should we stop buying platform storage and just abstract away all the hardware behind these types of interfaces for users? Can, it, can that kind of, do you think that is the way to go? Um, Boy, is that, that, that is a provocative question. Is that going to <laughs> is that going to meet the need, needs of these types of users or what? Uh, so the the scales for us are you know are people who have kilobytes worth of tables up to uh, tens of terabytes worth of tomography data. That's really mm -hmm. where we live. We're not at the at the petabyte scale for a given use case yet, um, but I think we're maybe we're touching the hundreds of terabytes scale. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain value proposition in the seamlessness and the, 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 uh, the adaptability of HTTP. 
that might be worth uh, it might be worth some performance costs to some people. But something that would be interesting to me is making this service work over transports other than uh, HTTP TCP. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to think about generalizing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've I, laid I, some track for that in the code base, but it's not I, a priority yet. I yeah. definitely see the the value behind the interface that you've got. It it definitely addresses um a major what I think is actually a major issue, but is often like described as like people being kind of undereducated or whatever. It's just that people don't even understand the concept of files and directories really anymore, and mm -hmm. we've had at least one you know, facility tell us like, we hate your, we hate the depth of your file hierarchy, right? So mm. just like make that go away, right? Um, I think this, this goes a long way to actually providing the interface that people want to think about in terms of accessing their data. But I'm kind of, I'm a little bit dubious that if we were to, you know, you mentioned it set up in spin today, we would basically just be kind of like, you know, extending a long straw around just simply drinking from the cup, you know? Yeah, right. So. No, it's a good point. And to your, to your first point, an analogy that gets tossed around a lot, so maybe everyone's heard it, but I like it, is that it's it's songs, not MP3s. Like when I was in high school, we dealt with yeah. MP3s, and now we right. deal with songs. Um, I don't ever want to get to the point where someone can't get a file if they want it, right? I don't want to be iTunes necessarily, but uh, it is, I, I like the tiled serve directory mode because it, you can imagine someone using getting at their data the old way directly on the file system when they want to, okay. but also having the option to get it at the new way. And I think for for nurse deployment specifically, the path may be deploy tiled at some scale, have both of these modes available, and then learn what we learn, right? Mm -hmm. See cool. what we can optimize, see how much the the service side caching can buy back what you pay in going through HTTP? That's an open question for me. Yeah, I was going to make that point that, that there are a lot of use cases that have different usage patterns. Some of them will be very amenable to, to caching, both on the server and the client side, and some of them won't. And I, that's going to be, to me, that seems like the limit of HTTP's ability to, to serve quickly. Right. Okay, cool. There's two more hands up. One is from Hyde. Hey, this is Heya. Um, I wanted to kind of build on, uh, well, you mentioned like uh, in one of your comments about the user experience. And so I was wondering like, uh, in terms of scale, is a single server enough to meet the user communities, you know, expectations of the experience that they're supposed to get? Or, you know, what kind of um, backend requirements are needed uh, or, or do you um, tell people who are interested in using tiled that they're going to need to set up in order to meet a certain user expectation of responsiveness. Right. So it's, it's a little early to be pitching it as you know, a robust, scalable tool. I would say that we are designing it to someday be robust. We're trying to think carefully ahead about, uh, about what will scale. Uh, but I don't, uh, you know, we haven't used this for more than a couple power users at a time so far. And okay. until we do that, we can't make uh, firm recommendations. What we know so far is with a single node deployment and a heavy uh, tomography data set user pulling of order 100 terabytes down with um, task workers and so on, that we can, we can service that with a single node with about, uh, I think it's uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM and uh, I think eight, eight uh, cores working in parallel. I, I'm hoping that of order 10 nodes about that scale mm -hmm. should be able to support, I'm gonna start with three, but maybe go as high as 10, uh, should be able to support the NSLS2 user community unless all the tomographists get hungry at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, uh, one other just quick question about, um, you mentioned your aggregate uh, you know, scale of data being in the uh, you know, terabytes, tens of terabytes, but uh, do yep. you also look at like number of files that uh, you know, because that certainly can impact. Yeah, no, that's uh, a great point. A bunch of small files or large files, or so at the at the small scale, everything's in Mongo for us, so it's not really in files anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we only are using file based access for the large data sets, which you know necessarily avoid the many small files use case. So I think we'll be limited by the performance of the I/O, but I'm not aware. Um, 
of anything specific and how tiled interacts with that. I don't know, Dylan, do you have a better answer there? Uh, not specifically. I think I think we have seen some use cases where the IO, if with without caching, without warming up a cache, the IO on small files on sl slow file systems has been the the first uh, slow point. Yeah, that we have to deal with. So that's that's certainly what something that has to do with that. Okay. Thanks. This is awesome. Though. For example, this the spin right now for a while that on our spin implementation, we're just reading off of the community file system and, and we didn't do enough tooling to really know instrumentation to really know exactly where it was, but it was not as fast as we would want to for a large for you know, 10,000 very small files to access. Right. right. I think we have one last question from Shayas here. Um, yeah, so maybe my question is more, this looks really cool. What is the sort of long-term funding slash sustainability model for this? So if I were to be one, if I want to pick this up for one of my projects, like, you know, what, what kind of long-term support should I expect? <laughs> Yeah, so we've, we've been working on, you know, we look at this as sort of the next phase of data broker, and I won't get into the long answer of how it relates to data broker, but it, maybe it's a more general, a general foundation that, uh, that works alongside it. Data broker has been going for six years, and we bet our facilities data access plan on it. So I think we're firmly attached to something in this space, and we're at a point now where, you know, we just put out a, a BNL press release about Tiled last week. So we're, we're talking about it in public. Uh, we're, we're keeping the name. Uh, and I see Stuart's video is on, which means he's here. So thank goodness. Go ahead, Stu. <laughs> all, all I was going to say was you know, <laughs> we, we're going to rely on it for data access to the NSLS2. So as long as the NSLS2 is here, we should be OK. So 30 years, hopefully. But hopefully we'll have. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. That was. Um... That was a great presentation. So we're just, I think, one minute short, uh, the top of the hour. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and this was definitely interesting and I uh, will keep in touch.